Hello, everyone. This is Derek Taylor for HIST 129, the history of the modern Europe. And this is uh, the last full lecture, anyway, of the course. And this is the final, brings us to the sort of beginning of the end of the early modern period and the origins of the French Revolution, the revolution in France, France which brings to an end. Well, well the, uh, the monarchy eventually will cause uh, a real massive break with the past, the end of absolute monarchy in France. And is the beginning of the end of that period we call the early modern uh, era. It's usually actually fairly rare. You can mark off, in reality anyway, different periods of history with a single event or a single set of events. The French Revolution is one of them. It's one of those events you can't really you, you can't overstate its importance. And so what I want to do in this lecture is uh, you're going to, for your last essay, you're going to be writing uh, an essay uh, on something that's called counterfactuals in, in history. And what I want you to do in that essay, if you go to the module, you'll see, is to tell me whether or not the French Revolution would have happened if the American Revolution had not happened first. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, leading up to uh, in the course of this lecture, but the purpose of this assignment and the purpose of this lecture is to talk about various possible uh, things that brought about the French Revolution. Not to decide, by the way, which ones are most important, because again, this is something art historians still definitely argue about. Where did this come from? I mentioned one of the possible origins last time in Jansenism, my lecture on Jansenism, the influence of these Catholic ideas from this uh, movement within the Catholic Church in France. There are, of course, other causes that are more normally associated with it. The idea is the Enlightenment. We'll talk about that and some other things in this lecture. But what I want you to think about is, OK, how would you figure this out for yourself? Because to be a, a thoughtful person, you should know something about the French Revolution. To be an educated person, you should have some sort of opinion. And that's what that essay is for is to think, okay, what do I think are the most important causes? And what I want you to do in that essay is tell me, okay, if the American Revolution wasn't that important, what was? And to give some uh, some evidence, some some reason why, okay, it's not as important as other causes. Again, I don't expect you to do this in some academic way. I want you to do it and think carefully about what was more important and why, what was less important and why. Uh, in any case, that's the basic idea. So let's get started and talk about um, the background of the French Revolution. <clears throat> and now I'm going to start out talking about here about war and diplomacy, because these play, these are very important for the lead up to what will happen in 1789 in France. In fact, if you remember the last time I talked about this subject, there had been a war in Europe the War of Austrian Succession in 1748, in which Prussia, uh, Frederick of Prussia, Frederick II, took a piece of land from the uh, Kingdom of Austria, Emperor of Austria, uh, called Silesia, and managed to hold it. And so this is the ultimate cause of this next war, because a peace treaty that was signed at Eilat Chapelle in 1748 didn't really satisfy, especially Austria, who wanted their land back. And you also had simmering tensions, long-standing tensions between the British and the French, uh, and which will uh, feed into this new conflict and have drastic conflict, uh, consequences for the future. And in fact, what's going to happen because of the failure of I love La Chapelle is you're going to have great powers in Europe engage not merely in a war in Europe, but a, an, uh, a really a world war uh, in, a, in essence, which is going to begin not in Europe, but of course in the in the in uh, in um, in uh, North America, in what is today the United States. Obviously, this is you, know, you take your American history courses in high school. You should know what the French and Indian War is. That conflict, which begins in the Ohio River Valley in 1754 between French and British troops. And actually, if you don't know, by the way, what sets this off, there are rival land claims in the Ohio River Valley between well several different groups. Uh, French, British colonists, and uh, a militia from Virginia was sent sent to this area under the leadership of George Washington 
and they immediately got captured. <laughs> and that caused British, regular British troops to have to be sent there to, to go and get them. And that's what kicked off the fighting in North America. And so the British and the French are, are in, uh, in the process of duking it out and trying to come to blows over this. What's going to happen is, uh, in order to fight this war, the Brits want to have, because I need to step back again, remember you had a revolution, a revolution, you had a change of dynasties in 1715 in Britain, where they, uh, a, uh, a German king, German prince from the, uh, from the electorate of Hanover came from the Holy Roman Empire to the throne of England, George I was a German uh, speaking king. So at this point, Britain has interest to defend in Europe. So in order to fight this war with, with the, uh, uh, the French in colonial sphere, which by the way also includes India, which I'll get to in a moment, they have to secure their interest in, in Central Europe. So they do this by doing something kind of shocking to contemporaries. They sign an alliance with Prussia. Why is this shocking? Well, because Britain had fought the last war against Prussia. And in fact, this gave an opening to the Austrians who wanted to isolate Prussia because they wanted to go to war with them. And so, and this is really shocking, of course, because France, a lot, they make an alliance with the French. Why is that shocking? Remember, going back to the early modern period, what was the biggest, you know, conflict on the continent in Europe? What, what two dynasties were at each other's throats? The Bourbon monarchy in France, uh, the Habsburg monarchy in Austria. So this is a shocking affair. And one of the reasons, by the way, it's shocking by the middle of the 18th century is that it gives a slightly confessional or religious aspect to these alliances. Protestant Brit uh, Britain, Prussia against France, Catholic France and Catholic Austria. Now, as it happens, it's not along religious lines, but there is something in the background there. And in fact, they will also um, sign an alliance, will the Austrians, with uh, with uh, Russia, they'll come to this and be very important in a moment we'll talk about, but also uh, Sweden wants to come in and take Pomerania, one of, uh, uh, one of uh, Prussia's possessions. Now, what makes this all the more dramatic for Prussia is the Brits have a strategy for, for conducting this war. They call it their blue water strategy. Basically, what this means is they're going to use their navy, which is the best in the world, to fight wars overseas, India, the Caribbean, North America. And they're going to basically bankroll Frederick the Great and his army. Again, he's got the best army in Europe. However, Frederick's, I mean, the Prussian state's very small. They only have a few million people. And they're surrounded by some of the biggest countries in Europe, France, Russia. You throw in Sweden, later on Spain. Uh, these are daunting odds. And in fact, Frederick tries to reach out to uh, Austria in 1756 to explain this wasn't meant as any provocation to the Austrians. Naturally, the Austrians didn't take kindly to it. And so Frederick the Great, being the aggressive general that he was, decided to strike first and invade Austria. And so he does. And for the first two or three years, well, look at this in a moment, this begins this war. I'll give you the, the background of where we're talking about. Uh, in terms of breakdown, you can just see the stuff that takes place overseas. Again, up in Canada, they're fighting in, they will fight in uh, modern day Canada. They will fight in New York. They'll also be fighting uh, in the Ohio River Valley, as I mentioned. And of course, down in the West Indies, there's going to be a conflict there as well. And then of course, down in the coastal areas where uh, that's mainly where the British and the French have their areas of influence. Uh, so they're fighting for control of these colonial territories. You also have this war, and uh, unlike the War of Austrian Succession, which took place in different places, this is another war mostly fought in Germany, as you can see, mostly in and around uh, Bohemia, uh, Central Empire, and then in Prussia. And so all that sort of uh, fighting will take place. You also have, by the way, Portugal coming into uh, the alliance with Britain, if you get noticed down there. So it's a real big coalition allied against Frederick II, Frederick the Great, in 1756. And so that begins the Seven Years' War, which is really a, an imperial war. 
Now, what happens is this is actually where Frederick, the, Frederick makes his name, Frederick the Great, is that for the first two or three years, he'll lose a few battles, some of them important, but for the most part, he triumphs over multiple odds. Again, his armies are outnumbered sometimes, many times, two to one, and he'll win a series of spectacular battles. Um, the most, I think the biggest one where he was most outnumbered was the Battle of Luthen, 1756. Uh, memory serves, it's correct. Um, but the first two or three years, he manages to fight off most of these, uh, most of these uh, <coughs> um, allied troops. But probably the most important battle for our purposes, because it goes way beyond military uh, concerns, is the Battle of Rossbach. In fact, if you go back for a second, you can see this is that one battle pointed out on the map just for a second, in Saxony, takes place in 1757. And then he explains something here. This is an important battle because the French strategy going this war was they were gonna give some aid to Austria, but they wanted to give minimal aid. Why? Because they wanted to focus their, their, their uh, resources on the colonial sphere uh, so they could fight the British. And in fact, they had a strategy, basically they were hoping to do was make enough territorial gains in, um, uh, in, um, uh, in Europe to offset any possible losses in the colonial sphere. What happens at the Battle of Rossbach is that Frederick basically destroys the advance into Saxony and into, into uh, German territory. And at this point, the French are forced to spend more, a lot more resources, send extra troops to defend the Austrians. It also means that the, they have to give, uh, because at this point, this is a, to explain here, uh, they have a lot of influence in Poland, in Central Europe. Let me go back to the map for one second. Excuse me. They have a lot of influence in Poland. Uh, you can see where Poland's at. They have to give Russia uh, permission to go sort of move their troops through Poland Lithuania to go fight here. Why is this important? Because this gives, uh, it will weaken French influence over Poland and increase that of the Russians. But it means that their, their plans for European hegemony, they're, they're still planning to dominate Europe like they always had in Louis XIV. Uh, they are permanently stifled because of the Battle of Rossbach. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte would later say that the Battle of Rossbach was the battle that led to the, to the uh, demise of the Bourbon regime. Because it in effect meant, I mean, you think about all those, those victories that Louis XIV had won. Under Louis XV, all of a sudden, their advance in Europe is stymied. And again, remember, one of the real big selling points of absolute monarchy was what? Gloire. In other words, the ability to win battles. And so it's a devastating defeat in the long run to uh, the French. At the same time, the British defeat the French. First in India, actually it takes several years. They won a major battle in 1757 at Plassey, uh, Robert Clive uh, of the uh, uh, English East India Company defeats uh, 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 French forces there. And then in Canada in 1759, uh, they take Quebec. Um, uh, General Wolfe takes Quebec from the French in Canada. They'll complete this process in India by 1764, effectively for a few outposts, except for a few outposts in India, kicking the French out of there. However, by this time, the Russians have begun to pour troops into, uh, into Prussia. And in fact, they will overrun Berlin, the capital of Prussia in 1760. Uh, things get so bad that at one point, Frederick uh, the Great actually considers committing suicide. So in essence, this all could have been overthrown by the Russians. What happens, and this is, people forget this at the time, and they immediately laud Frederick the Great, because they all thought he was going to be destroyed, which the thing is, he probably would have been, except for the fact that the Russian Tsarina, uh, Elizabeth, who was ruling Russia at the time, who hated Frederick, dies in 1762. Uh, and her successor, I believe it was her brother, is Peter III, maybe her son, I can't recall. But the point is, Peter III loves Frederick. He immediately calls for a peace and draw, withdraws from the war. Uh, and that's what saves Berlin and Prussia from being destroyed. And so hostilities eventually cease, and the Treaty of Paris is signed in 1763, um, putting an end to this uh, great conflict. Can't really overstate the importance of the Seven Years' War. Several things come out of this. Prussia cements its status as a great power. 
it is basically, again, for good or ill for the future, going to be a major power going forward, even though it's tiny on the basis of its military um, success. Second, I've already mentioned these two actually, Russia will gain influence over Poland. This is very important for the future. Go back for a second, just to show you the map one more time, because it's important. Take a look at where Poland is. Take a look at where Russia is. Take a look at where Prussia is. In 1772, there'll be a partition of territory between Prussia and Russia, I believe Austria perhaps as well, uh, which will carve up Polish territory. In 1795, it will become complete and Poland will disappear from the map entirely. So uh, again, some of the fate of nations, it basically leads to the disappearance of Poland <laughs> because of the weakness between these great powers were um, emerging out of this with more power themselves. Thirdly, I've already mentioned, uh, French continental ambitions are thwarted. Can't overstate that. It's the most important thing that comes out of this in many respects. But finally, Prussia got to keep Silesia. Austria had to accept the status quo. Russia got some influence, but the real victor in the Seven Years' War is Britain also a major a major uh, turning point. Why? Because Britain had been seen as a great power before, but now they were seen in some ways, as, uh, in some ways, because they won, um, as sort of rivaling or even supplanting France as the great power in Europe. And not because of their continental ambitions, because of their empire. Britain had for decades, and for a long time now, instead of building an army, built a navy. Uh, and they use that navy, of course, to make themselves wealthy. Commerce, but now also through conquering territories. Uh, the um, the uh, final um, status of various uh, colonial prizes at the end of this war uh, emphasized this to the great powers. Uh, they took, of course, Canada. They kicked the French uh, out of uh, India. They gained a few islands in the Caribbean, which again, these are the most important colonies, economically speaking, this is the sugar plantations. Um, and at the end of the, the, the negotiations, they basically gave a few back, a couple of islands back to the French. They gave, um, they received actually Florida from the Spanish, almost, uh, almost contemptuously. Uh, and this really impressed people in, especially in faults. Uh, and the people at Versailles will remember this <laughs> because, of course, if you know what happened, in, it happens in this, you know, this period, we're going back to Louis XIV, somebody wins a war, everybody else in Europe wants to sort of, you know, suppress their influence, everybody gangs up on them in that next major conflict. And the next major conflict involving European powers, can you guess what it is? That's right, the war for independence of the American colonies. Uh, because of, I'm not going to go through the American side of this at all. I want you to think about this conflict as, an, as a European conflict, because of course it's a civil war between British subjects in North America. But even from the beginning of the fighting, France and Spain, again, they lost the last war, they want to stick it to the Brits, are supplying the colonists uh, clandestinely in the first few years of the fighting. They don't start to commit themselves until one major turning point in the war. You better know this if you're an American historian, if you know anything about American history. Uh, Battle of Saratoga in 1778 in New York proved to the French, and they're the ones who were most uh, eager to do this, that the colonists could actually fight and win a conventional European style battle. They do. The French sign an alliance with um, the American colonists, recognize the United States, which by the way, Almost the moment they do this, the Brits reach out to the colonists and try to sign a peace treaty at that point. At that point, they realize that they, they do not want to fight France again. It's over, effectively. Once that happens, the colonists say, well, sorry, the, the Americans say, nah, we're good. And in the next two years, Spain and the Netherlands sign alliances with the nascent United States. And in fact, uh, they will actually contribute. I mean, there's actually, you know, the uh, uh, troops and you know about Lafayette. I won't, I won't belabor this. Uh, but suffice to say, the French aid, but also the French Navy is the most important thing, because in the intervening years since the end of the Seven Years' War, the French had built a fine navy. Admiral de Grasse helps um, the colonists, you know, break any potential British blockade and moves troops 
again, it's effectively the end of the war. The Brits cannot win it after that. But in addition, I'm talking about the, the mainland, uh, there's also fighting in the Caribbean and in, in India. Remember, the French and the Spanish want to get colonies back. And so there's fighting in the Caribbean from the 1780s, in which the Brits basically beat them off. Uh, and in India as well, the French overtures to take uh, to gain some influence fail. This is why, by the way, I'm not even mentioning the, the war in America ends in 1781, right? The Cornwallis surrenders at the Battle of Yorktown. The reason why there's a, a peace treaty not signed until 1783 is because Spain, but especially France, are trying to get something, get some territorial gains out of this uh, until uh, 1783. And the outcome is, well, several things, obviously. The Brits eventually recognize the independence of the uh, US, United States. Spain will receive Florida back from Britain, which eventually, of course, the state, United States. But the big thing is France got nothing for their troubles. Saw the humiliation of the Brits, but they got no territory out of it. And as we're going to see, they spent quite a lot of money. They actually floated $2 million in loans to the, to, to the nascent United States government in this war, in addition to all the military and um, personnel uh, that they, that they, military equipment and personnel that they provided them with. And so you have this big you know, get back at Britain, but it doesn't really do anything for France. As we're going to see, it may actually have contributed to its the downfall of the monarchy, which actually did all this. So that's war and diplomacy in the last half century. And if you haven't noticed, by the way, I make this explicit, we're concentrating on the post-1750 period here, leading up to uh, 1789. The march of ideas, enlightenment and the ancien regime if you've ever heard the term Ancien Regime, which means old regime, the old order. And you need to talk about the, the Enlightenment. I have not talked about the Enlightenment yet in this course, even though you probably heard, and it's correct, that the beginnings of the Enlightenment begin with people like John Locke and Benedict Cart, and people like that in the 17th century. It has roots in the earlier period. But what I want to talk about here is why these ideas become important after 1750. And we're talking about ideas as a possible origin point or source of the changes that happen, which we call eventually the French Revolution. And one thing I need to talk about here is the, the term enlightenment, because from the course of the 17th to the 18th centuries, that term shifts its meaning in Western Europe. You have to remember, up until the 17th century, the term enlightenment, um, it meant something different than what we mean it when we use that term now, we use it as meaning something like the triumph of reason, rationality uh, over superstition and false religious belief, dogma, stuff like that. Up until the seven, end of the 17th century, enlightenment meant the light of Christ. It meant the bringing of the light of Christian truth into a world of pagan darkness. And in fact, in some ways, this is going to be, as you, especially as you get after 1750, a self-conscious change in terms, people using that phrase um, in order to distinguish themselves from that earlier notion of this. Um, it's after 1750 in France, France, France especially, that that term becomes, that, that the Enlightenment, as we think of it, becomes a self-conscious party of philosophers, writers, and the like, uh, who believe um, uh, as, do, uh, as does uh, Voltaire, who writes this in 1764, um, that superstition you know, sets the world in flames, philosophy quenches it. Uh, when he says superstition, he, he, he means a lot of things people would have meant up until very recently, enlightenment. <laughs> That's the key shift here. It's an inversion. It's a subversion of those earlier beliefs in some regards. If you think of what we usually mean by the enlightenment, right? We think of it as being anti-religious or being anti this or that. We'll talk about this in a moment and flesh that out. That's traditionally what we thought of it as being. One thing to keep in mind is that one of the things that makes possible uh, the, the emergence of this self-conscious uh, self party in France is the very stability of the Austrian regime, as we're going to see. The fact that despite you know being stymied in war in terms of expansion, 
the absolute estate was, was able to provide stability internally is what allows for the growth of a public receptive of criticism of, their, of the absolute monarchy. Um, it's probably, it's a bad combination for the monarchy because, okay, we've, I'm going back thinking again about war. Remember in 1715, the War of Spanish Succession, the coalition against Louis XIV wanted to go into the, the kingdom itself of France and put it down, couldn't do it. France was too stable, too powerful. So it provided internal stability without, of course, uh, well, I'll get to other reasons in a moment, without, uh, but at the same time, providing a space and ironically, not a legal one, of course, in many instances, but a growth of the public receptive to criticism of it. So it's an ironic thing in a lot of ways um, that it happens, but it happens after 1750. Now, in terms of actual ideas, I think I've mentioned this before, other lectures, I'm reiterating it here, a lot of the ideas that become, well, I wouldn't even say widespread, but that become more popular in this period have their roots in the 17th century, even earlier. Contract theory, again, I, you know, you can write the Middle Ages for this, but definitely in its modern form, back to Hobbes, Locke, people like that in the 17th century. Uh, skepticism, philosophical skepticism, that's an ancient, you know, um, ancient idea, but in the context of post-Reformation Europe, it takes on a different hue, because we mean skepticism about the ability to distinguish between true and false. You really can't be, have a, by the way, have a, a supernatural religion if you can't, if you're worried about just in natural terms, the ability to distinguish between true and false, it makes it really hard, but that goes back to the 16th and 17th centuries. People like Montaigne, the essayist, you haven't heard his name, Pierre Bale, who was actually a French Protestant, Huguenot, but he was very skeptical of reason. And so if you get a lot of this, you get some of the skepticism in the Enlightenment thinkers we'll come to in a moment, uh, it has roots. It's not totally brand new. Toleration, religious toleration, definitely goes back to the 17th century. Uh, Roger Williams, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned him, but Roger Williams actually goes beyond that. He's the uh, founder of Rhode Island in, uh, in the uh, British colonies. He'll write a, a work called The Bloody Tenet of Persecution in the 1640s, where he advocates for full-blown religious liberty, like free and equal for everybody, even Catholics. That's an amazing thing for a Protestant to say in the 17th century. But mostly it's toleration. There are people, actually, again, people debate this. You can find precursors in the Middle Ages. But the modern form, it, it's been around since people like Locke are writing his letter on toleration in the 1690s. Materialism. Definitely something associated with enlightenment. Again, uh, notions of Epicurean uh, atomism already present in the 17th century, embraced by people who are religious thinkers in some ways. And there are people like Thomas Hobbes, who is a thoroughgoing materialist, uh, proclaimed publicly he wasn't an atheist, nobody believed him. It's possible he was just saying that <laughs> in, order avoid, in order to avoid getting killed. Uh, so we don't really know. And we do know, again, as I mentioned before on this course, in France, the word atheist takes on its modern meaning in the middle of the 17th century. Um, even so, you, you, you don't get many people before the, uh, you know, the post-1750, you know, last half of the 18th century really proclaiming that they're atheists. In fact, as you really don't have many after that either, uh, for obvious reasons, it's dangerous to do so. But it might have been, you know, things like deism. I don't want to talk about deism much in this, this lecture. I think it gets kind of overblown, but it, it, it could have been easily uncovered for people who were actually atheists, let's put it that way. The only way to go public with, I don't believe in traditional Christian beliefs without, <laughs> without uh, having to risk anything uh, in the 17th or 18th century. And that, of course that leads us to, you know, atheism. Is that a, is that a genuine novelty in the, in the 18th century? Probably not, probably not, probably has precursors. Um, what is novel, we'll get to this in a moment, is the open expression of it. Um, that's that's really novel, as we'll see. And what happens, of course, and this is why I'm talking about this, is that the so-called Lumière, called the philosophe, whatever you want to call them, in the latter half of the 17th century, um, has you know uh, it has several uh, several um, causes, uh, but it's it's there's interesting things involved in this. One is on a political level. There's long been, if we're thinking about this in terms of you know enlightenment versus authority, there's long been uh, admiration for the British political system uh, in France by the 1750s. 
Um, Voltaire, who we'll come back to in a moment, spends time in exile in Britain for a long time. He really admires it, thinks it'd be more open than the French political system. Uh, the Baron Montesquieu writes the spirit of the laws in 1748, arguing for something like checks and balances, famously, which would influence the American uh, founders, the writers of the American Constitution. Uh, and so he's influenced by this to a certain degree. And so you have, uh, but you're having criticisms of that system emerge in my point by the middle of the century, but more successful than this, this is really the, the symbol of its success, these ideas, is the publication of the Encyclopedia uh, from 1751 to 1766. Now, as you know, um, the, the Encyclopedia uh, was um, published, well, the two main movers are, are Denis Diderot and um, God, I guess Jacques d'Alembert, I can't remember d'Alembert's first name, uh, to, uh, d'Alembert was a man. I can't remember, Diderot, Diderot was a philosopher. Um, both atheists, like openly atheists. And there had been encyclopedias before. And in fact, this, this project began as a translation of another set of encyclopedias, but it becomes something else because they use the articles in this encyclopedia to mount a systematic assault on not just, you know, the British political, uh, excuse me, the, the reigning political system, but you know, all the sort of ideals of knowledge that came out of, you know, well, medieval Europe that were still kind of current, you know, uh, on tradition, on custom, on, uh, on unaided authority. It's a sort of uh, onslaught on these things. And of course, by the way, it's banned in France, officially. Here's the kicker. It becomes a bestseller as it gets published in uh, Switzerland. Uh, and eventually they'll make its way back into France. It makes its way into France with the connivance of the man who was responsible for the censorship regime in the monarchy, my name Malzeau. Malzeau was actually a, a privately a proponent of freedom of the press. Uh, and this is my point about this system. Um, we tend to think of it as being repressive, the absolute monarchy, and it could be. But if you had the goodwill of that of the monarch, of his ministers, you could get away with stuff. Uh, and this is this is exemplified by nobody more than Voltaire. Voltaire, of course, from the 1730s, becomes a famous writer. He's also, you know, a, a pariah in many ways in France. Over the decades, his reputation will improve, partly because of his popularity. His ideas become more popular as the century goes on. But also because uh, uh, in the 1750s, Frederick the Great, you know, Prussia, the great Prussian general, starts up a, cor a public correspondence with Voltaire. He admires him. And this greatly enhances Voltaire's reputation. Uh, and of course, he as well, he moves to Switzerland, he moves out of France. So he's free from the publication restrictions. So he can publish whatever he wants. His works get back into France. They get read by the very small uh, literate public there. Uh, and by the 1750s and 60s, he's, a, he's really a celebrity, international celebrity. He's almost an institution in his own right. For all that, yes, the, the you know, church uh, can't stand him, stuff like this. Um, he's actually uh, pretty much free a after a certain point to do what he wants. And of course, he uses his celebrity to do things like you know, argue for toleration. This is the, uh, famously, it's the case of, oh, God, I can't remember the guy's name, Le Caf. Um, This was the French Protestant who gets um, uh, uh, put to death. And so he's uh, arguing on behalf of religious minorities. But uh, he's doing it with relative security and safety is my point. Uh, it's because of, ironically, it's because of not just the success and the stability of the absolute monarchy, you can say it's a good thing. It's also because of the arbitrariness of it. <laughs> uh, as long as you have authority you're on your side, you're okay. And of course, it doesn't have anything to do with like, you know, equal treatment or things of that nature. But this is why, and I mentioned this in my last lectures, Voltaire is a fan of absolute monarchy as is Immanuel Kant, we'll get to him in a second, the German philosopher, they admire it partly because they, they, uh, they know that an, what they call an enlightened monarch can defend, has enough power to defend people with unpopular ideas. Voltaire is not a Democrat, and he's not somebody who thinks that all pin, opinions are created equal. And so uh, his weird support of a certain type of absolute monarchy, again, if you're seeing little, some, some tensions in the what we call the Enlightenment, you, that's good. 
there are tensions. It's kind of an interesting thing about them. And just to, you know, give you, you've heard this before, but it needs repeating here. There are certain ideas that, are, you know, we'll go through some of these books, famous books in a second. I'm not going to belabor this, but some general ideas that link most of this stuff together. Uh, one of these is the idea of historical progress. This is something Voltaire is responsible for in his historical work. He writes a book in 1751 called The Age of Louis XIV, in which he argues that the world's moving progressively in stages of greater and greater, you know, greater and greater knowledge and enlightenment. He thinks of his age as being, you know, uh, the best one. Uh, it's an idea of progress, right? That history is moving toward greater and greater, whatever you want to call it. This idea is not new with him. Um, this is something that uh, Enlightenment historiography contributes to, right? Not only writers like Voltaire, uh, but also uh, someone who is a contemporary, a man named uh, Henri Robert uh, Turgot, as we'll, we'll encounter again in a second. Turgot would eventually become an, uh, an economist, basically, uh, in the later part of the 18th century. But in 1750, he, well, he wrote two discourses as a student at the Sorbonne in Paris. If you know what the Sorbonne is, the Sorbonne is the, the theological university in Paris. He was a theology student. He abandons it, but he begins as a theology, theology student. And he publishes the two discourses in 1750, uh, the first of which is called On the Benefits Which the Christian Religion Has Conferred on the Human Race. And effectively, I'm mentioning this because he sees Christianity as having brought social progress to the world. Specifically, it brings, you know, the idea of charity and, and whatever, love for your neighbor uh, from, uh, to a pagan world. That's his idea. That's that idea in that first discourse. The second discourse is called a philosophical review of the success and advances of the human mind. And this is the one he actually is famous for, because it'll lay out a, a sort of, you know, idea that history moves in sort of like three or four stages, literally the same sort of, you know, almost mechanical, it goes like this, goes like this, goes like this, leading up to, of course, the present day. And the two things about this is one, it's pretty clearly a secularizing of the idea that Christianity brought, brought enlightenment to the human race. The other thing is that it, it's basically a very mechanistic way of the way history works, which is also very Eurocentric. Uh, this idea of historical progress usually gets, and rightfully so, criticized today as being not just Eurocentric, but being really simplistic. <laughs> History doesn't move in, in, uh, in predetermined stages. But for people in the 17th and 18th centuries who wanted to see the world in more positive terms, this was a way of doing that. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's fascinating that it has that relationship. I'm mentioning all this because this goes back to, of course, um, what we call the Enlightenment view of authority, which partly it's a progress away from religious authority. Instead of using, uh, you know, instead of basing your ideas on customs or along, you know, institutions like the monarchy, uh, emphasis on empiricism, right, on sensory data, on experience, right, thinking for yourself rather than using authorities or something like this. In intellectual terms, I've already mentioned this, you know, the encyclopedia is kind of like a model for the enlightenment view of knowledge, that reason has this unlimited capacity to sort of catalog perfectly everything. I'm overdoing this, by the way, <laughs> I didn't actually come out and say this, but there's this great optimism about what reason can do, about what nature can be, right? Against what? Tradition, against metaphysical abstraction, I'm thinking here again of the medieval tradition of scholasticism, right? Very abstract, very much metaphysical in its, its properties. There's this idea of focusing on this world, not on any ideas of metaphysics or a world beyond the senses or something like that, which plays into this it's in all the articles of the encyclopedia. And finally, we get to an important point here. The Enlightenment is definitely a lay-centric authority. It's a lay-centric well, lay movement. Whatever else we can say about its relationship to religion or theology, 
it is definitely about laymen asserting their authority over priests. Uh, it is definitely anti-clerical, um, both in terms of intellectual life, but also, of course, in political terms. A rejection, wholehearted, full-throated, visceral rejection of any sort of clerical authority in political affairs, uh, but also uh, against any uh, any attempts to dictate belief uh, to people uh, against individuals. All this is, again, you've probably heard this before, but it's worth uh, just reiterating because it is true in many regards. Lots of revisions, the way historians view the Enlightenment, these things remain when you talk about those certain things. And just, just to reiterate, you know, how, you know, just how many big, you know, important works were published after 1750 or so. I won't go through it. This is just a selection, by the way, talking about the 40 years from the publication of Montesquieu's Spirit of the Laws down to the revolution. Let me go through some of these. Georges Leclerc is the Comte de Buffon's um, aristocrat, uh, started publishing his natural history, which is just his, you know, history of, you know, species, basically from 1749 up to 1788. Uh, it was well regarded at the time. The only reason I mention it is because in the introduction to his natural history, Leclerc clearly advocates for a materialist interpretation of, of, of natural phenomena. He's insinuating his materialism into his scientific work and become very influential for that reason. Uh, 1750, of course, you have the entry of Jean-Jacques Rousseau into all this. Uh, I haven't mentioned Rousseau. I won't belabor his contributions. At the same time that Turgot was writing those, those discourses on how humankind advances in stages, Rousseau entered a, an essay contest in, for, to the, uh, the Academy of Dijon uh, in France, is one of these you know, intellectual academies. And the question, I think I'm getting this wrong, the question was, in what ways has civilization you know, basically helped mankind or in, in made for the improvement of mankind? I'm, I'm getting this mixed up, but it's basically the, the question he had to answer. And if you don't know, famously, his answer was, it hadn't. <laughs> his idea is like that civilization actually corrupted humankind. <laughs> and this is Rousseau, the idea was not original with him, but this is the idea, of course, of you know, something like the noble savage, right? Like mankind in his original state was actually not perfect. There were problems, but like it was more whole, more together, less corrupt. That's the main thing. Uh, he wins the prize for this, by the way. It's not uh, discourse in the arts and sciences is actually not as interesting as his later one, which he didn't win a prize for, which is his discourse on the origins of inequality. But he will play with that same idea in that work of mankind had this original wholeness, which he lost going into society, which he connects with things like freedom from constraint. And so the the major thing in Rousseau's thinking is how do you how do you uh, in society, try to recapture some of that freedom from restraint. Needless to say, Rousseau will be wildly, wildly important for the future of, of, of Western and European philosophy. It's also notable, of course, just how contradictory this is to what Turgot and a lot of other, you know, philosophers are saying. In other words, um, lots of tensions here, right? But similar things being said, or something similar to a certain degree, might be like David Hume, the Scottish philosopher. Uh, inquiry in the, uh, concerning the principles of morals in 751. Uh, basic, I'm dumbing this down. Forgive me if you are a philosophy major. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing this for the sake of time, but effectively, Hume cuts the cord. He's very skeptical about traditional notions of morality uh, with any sort of rational idea of what morality is. Morality has nothing to do with you know, reason or rational purposes or ends. Uh, it's basically what he calls sentiments, it's feelings. Uh, what we call morality is just a sort of rationalization um, of emotional <laughs> uh, desires. I already mentioned the Encyclopedia. Can't leave that out of here. I'm not even mentioning any of uh, Voltaire's works. Too many of them to list, um, but definitely him. You probably never heard of. Uh, you've never heard of Voltaire. You've probably never heard of Jean Ostruc. This was a, a fairly obscure work, but hugely important for the future. Uh, he wrote, and that's a condensed. Um, version of the title, Conjectures on Genesis in 1753. Astruc was a physician, he was a doctor, but he wrote a, a little book on uh, the book of Genesis in which he put forward for the first time uh, what's sometimes called the document, uh, the documentary hypothesis, the documentation hypothesis, meaning that 
um, both Jewish and Christian, Christian, Christian tradition had always attributed the first five books, the authorship of the first five books of the, of the Bible to Moses. Ostrich was the first one to suggest that no, it had actually been written by several different hands over time. He was comparing different differences in language uh, from different parts of Genesis and saying it was compiled over time um, by editors. Uh, it had to be published anonymously for obvious reasons. It would eventually become the basis, this idea for a lot of modern bi biblical scholarship. 1759, Adam Smith, the great Scottish uh, philosopher, economist, writes his book, A Theory of Moral Sentiments. Uh, again, dumbing this down, he's a friend of uh, David Hume. He's also talking about morality in terms of sentiments, but he has a much different view of this. He's talking, the big idea, take away from his ideas about this is that unlike Hume, who thinks it's just some sort of random thing about feelings, he thinks human beings are actually, you know, created or, or made for social interaction, particularly um, the moral sentiment of benevolence is important in Adam Smith. We have this, you know, altruistic, if you like, um, sentiment built into our nature, and it'll explain a lot of his ideas about things like the economy, which we could do in a second. Uh, Rousseau, The Social Contract, his uh, wildly popular book, you know, where he pushes the idea of a con social contract in a very different direction, where he's emphasizing, you know, popular, well, he's emphasizing the people, he's also emphasizing what he calls the general will, the monote general, right, that the, the whole of a society is more important than any of its parts. Hugely influential, best-selling book, as was his book, Emile, his educational novel, which, uh, again, um, scandalized church authorities that more or less denied original sin, but was uh, sold very well nonetheless. A couple of guys you haven't heard of, probably. Uh, Cesare Beccaria of Crimes and Punishments in 1764. Beccaria was a Milanese, Italian. Um, uh, well, he's the, fir he's the first legal philosopher, first person to actually systematically try to understand rationale behind you know laws and punishments in terms of crime and in fact he had a, a philosophy he was a reformer he wanted to you know get rid of things that were um you know things like torture use of torture in in investigations and cruel treatments and cruel punishments and he did this on the basis of what you know a hedonistic view of human nature that is to say of um what's good and what's bad are basically based on pleasure and pain. In other words, on a form of what will come to be called utilitarianism. And if you know who Jeremy Bentham is, philosopher in England, he's usually associated with this idea. Uh, he was inspired by Beccaria, uh, his work in the 1760s. Another important thinker, Johann Herder, you've probably not heard of him, Johann Gottfried Herder, a uh, Lutheran minister, in fact, but also a philosopher, wrote a very important work in 1774 called Another Philosophy of History for the Education of Humankind or Mankind. And that work is which he basically in terms of gives a philosophy of history, which is important because it's, it's, uh, it introduces a sort of cultural relativism into an idea of history in two ways. One is that he sees cultures as being, you know, um, peculiar as to say every culture has its own customs, own religion, own language. And this will become the basis for this will feed into modern ideas of nationalism in the 19th century. Uh, absolutely unique um, uh, cultures that way. The other thing that's important about it is that he will feed into this idea that every different culture is different in every specific era. That is to say, almost in a way they can't understand each other. So this idea that over time things change radically within history, it's also something Herder mentioned, which is then runs contrary to the ideals of, of, uh, of Voltaire and other people, which they see, they see civilizations as totally universal and sort of interchangeable. So very lots of in, interesting tensions here. I mentioned Joseph Priestley br uh, briefly, another um, scientist, but also a political type um, religious radical as well as Unitarian. I wrote his experiments and observations on different types of air in 1780, uh, 1774. And um, it's famous for getting rid of, finally, putting the, put the end to the whole notion of four elements. It's earth, wind, fire, water. And um, it's also a political work, if you can imagine. It's, it's partly a diatribe against what he calls, quote unquote, usurped authority of the state. Uh, his idea is that science is opposed to authority that way. So it's a dual, uh, a dual purpose in it. 
uh, Edward Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, begins publication in 1776. If you don't know Gibbon, this is the great uh, 12 volume <laughs> uh, work on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which if you don't know Gibbons, again, another person who's in, whose life is illustrative of this shift toward you know, openness to these types of ideas. The book, by the way, is a bestseller. Lots of criticism from churchmen because he takes a real skeptical line toward religion in terms of how it interacts with you know, public authority. And um, in fact, he actually attributes uh, the decline of the empire, one of the main sources, he blames Christianity for it. Um, the idea is that all the wealth that should have gone to the state and upholding the state went into the church instead. Uh, but given that uh, fascinating, not, less because he's, not least because he was a great uh, writer, and in fact, his work is it probably you're getting into the modern notions of history with Gibbon. Um, he's one of the first uh, writers to actually track down his sources, use footnotes to put them in his text to explain where he's getting all this. This is modern historiography. But his personal history is interesting because he spent a lot of his time in Europe, Switzerland, because when he was a child, uh, his father was a member of the Church of England. He wasn't terribly religious, uh, sends him up to Oxford. And while he's at Oxford, Oxford had. Oxford was kind of the, the repository of reactionary sentiments in the 18th century. It wasn't much of a university in the 18th century anymore, but you know, royalist sentiment there, um, Jacobite sentiments, um, old you know, high church Anglicanism, but also Catholics. And while he was at Oxford, Gibbon converted to Catholicism. And when his father found out about this, his father flipped. And so what he did was he sent him off, uh, pulled him out of Oxford, sent him to Switzerland to study with this um, French Protestant, but who was also a, a skeptic, with the idea of basically, as far, as far as I can tell, basically bleeding religion out of him entirely, which it did. He became a skeptic after this. But it's fascinating, you know, the fact that he did it, first of all, but secondly, the fact that it was better to be a skeptic than be a, a Catholic in 18th century, uh, um, uh, 18th century Britain, which is a pretty tolerant place, all things considered. It's a fascinating, fascinating comment on the times. Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in 1776. I'm not going to labor this, but I want to get to Kant. Uh, Immanuel Kant, uh, he publishes several things. He actually publishes, uh, publishes an essay in 1784 called What is Enlightenment? Auf Klarung in German, uh, where you're thinking about self-consciously what enlightenment is. Its critique of pure reason is kind of the apotheosis of development since the early modern period. Influenced by Hume's skepticism, I'm dumbing him down. Forgive me, philosophy majors, if you're reading this. Uh, his critique of pure reason, if I understand it correctly, uh, effectively breaks with that metaphysical tradition, you know, going back to Plato and Aristotle, where, you know, the idea is, it's a, uh, you know, philosophical realism is the idea that our, our mental picture of the world uh, matches up more or less with the actual world itself. We can know things about the world external to us in and of themselves. And Kant rejects all that. He says, we can't know anything about the world in and of itself, but we can know for certain and have certain knowledge of is our is the human mind itself, is our own mind. And not just our individual minds, but you know, our mind as its own, its own thing. Uh, 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 not merely a sort of individual subjectivity, but what's called transcendental uh, subject in his thinking. Uh, whereas you, we can know in great detail how we think, what we think, uh, and uh, and so that's his critique of pure idea of pure reason. All of which is again my point of going through all this. If you were an intelligent person, if you lived through this this era, if you were, I don't think that anybody would have read all these books. But if you could have been alive, been aware of all of these different ideas appearing one after the other, and this is just a sampling. There are others. You might think that the world was on the brink of great change, or should be. One thing to note about this is that almost nobody could or did, um, despite the fact that it's becoming more and more um, popular, some of these ideas. And of course, the other half of this is that one thing that might explain why ideas, again, they go together, it's a chicken egg thing, is the decline of Christianity to a certain degree. And the church, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, in that title there, Particularly in Catholic Europe, there's a drop in attendance across the Catholic world in the latter half of the 18th century, definitely in France and many places. Uh, vocations to the priesthood or to religious life, that is monastic life, uh, decline throughout Catholic Europe. 
More importantly, perhaps, there is a decline among the upper classes. This is really important to understand um, because you're going to have a lot of skepticism uh, coming out of the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, excuse me, the 18th century among the upper classes toward religion, and particularly toward religious authority. You know, in, in by the 17, um, 17, uh, 60s, 1770s in France, you know, whereas they had taken, for example, the Pope's authority fairly seriously. And by the 1760s, you know, Clement XIII, um, you know, the, the lay rulers that were trying in the 1760s to curb the church's uh, privileges and power, um, it basically provo it provoked nothing but ridicule uh, and retaliation among, you know, um, absolute monarchs and their ministers and some people in the upper classes. And this is really important to understand here. Um, you're getting a lot of cynicism. First of all, it, it's always bad when you lose the support of elites. <laughs> they have a lot of power. But the other thing here, and this is very crucial to understand, is that this is a break uh, with earlier, this is one of the big difference between this and the earlier period when we're talking about the Baroque, where we talk about the culture of the Baroque was <clears throat> um, um, aimed at the people and aimed at popular popular sentiments. For the most part, the upper classes shared those popular sentiments. What's going to shift really big after 1750 in a major way is that that's no longer the case. There is a, a lot of con lot of just out and out contempt for the lower orders, even on people by even on people by the way who are still devout and religious uh, in, among the upper classes, who are now are looking down more and more their noses at what they think of as being vulgar popular attitudes. And in fact, you're going to have this attitude feed into the reforms of absolute monarchs in the 18th century. Not only um, 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 uh, you know, um, my brain just died. Uh, uh, not I mentioned some of these before, not just attacking church privileges to a certain degree, absolute monarchs. But it's, it's, it's hard to stress this, right? You had, um, you know, um, why this is a change, Baroque culture applied to across all these classes. You had people like Joseph II in Austria in the 1780s, 1770s, 1790s, trying to um, make the liturgy more simplified, to take away the excesses of all these Baroque celebrations. Uh, it provoked a serious popular opposition to this. Uh, Frederick the Great in Germany, Frederick the Great was not religious at all, but uh, he tried to impose um, uh, on the Lutheran Church in in Prussia a more modernized hymn book, an enlightened hymn book. Lots of opposition to this. In Britain, in the same period, Britain tried to pass laws, relaxing laws against the Jews and Catholics, and um, they both provoked riots. One in the 1750s, the Catholic one in the late 17, uh, 1770s, uh, caused a major riot. Actually, this is 1780. This is the Gordon riots. Uh, for several days, you had riots against uh, Catholics in, in, uh, in London. And so just the sort of, and just a general sort of wanting to purge popular, uh, popular, you know, religion of its excesses was really, uh, it provoked, it provoked a lot of, a uh, lot of um, reaction at that point. And so uh, there is some of this, uh, partly is because of that, I think, uh, to a certain degree. And of course, it gets its greatest uh, expression in the attacks on the Jesuits uh, from in the 1750s. It's actually Portugal of all places. It's Minister Pombal um, is the first one. They, it's 1756. They, they, suppress, they kick the Jesuits out of there, out of, out of Portugal. Remember in 1764, the Jesuits are expelled from France. And then finally, it's suppressed altogether by the Pope in 1773, which does cause some problems, by the way, because and this is something I can't emphasize, despite the decline uh, to a certain degree in belief in the church and its authority in the latter half of the 18th century, the Jesuits, uh, it caused a problem because the, the church and virtually every other, not just the Catholic church, but uh, pretty much all education was run by um, religious bodies in the 17th and into the 19th century, into the end of the 19th century. And so especially suppressing the Jesuits caused problems because they ran some of the best schools in Europe. In fact, when they were um, expelled from France, I think it's expelled from France or, yeah, it was expelled from France. Um, Frederick the Great, the unbeliever, actually invited some of these Jesuits into Prussia because he admired their, um, their educational um, 
uh, acumen so much. But it's an indication of a turn against, you know, we tend to think of this as being the age of there's this total amity between church and state. It doesn't actually, uh, it, the Enlightenment turns uh, authority actually against itself this way to a certain degree. On the other hand, this is something we need to talk about here when I'm talking about the Enlightenment, its ideas. There is still, it's still prevalent. Um, most historians have accepted the fact that it didn't just die out. There used to be this thought, like, ah, it's so inevitable. Look at all these ideas. In fact, throughout the 18th century, and definitely more in the first half, but even in the second half of the 18th century, it still plays a huge role. Um, I mentioned before the phenomena of pietism in the 17th century in German lands. This is the idea of a very individualized, individualistic, but also a, a you know emotional approach to religion, you know, individual relationship, you know, uh, religion of the heart in German lands, which will revive in the 1720s the creation of the uh, uh, the Moravian Brethren, this is the church in, in Saxony in the in central uh, Germany. Uh, it'll feed into English, what I'm calling pietism, if I don't recognize that term. Um, some of these Moravian brethren got to London in the 1720s, and they would influence a young man named John Wesley. John Wesley was an Anglican, uh, he was Oxford Don, actually. And um, what happened was he was having a, a meeting with fellow uh, pious uh, Anglicans in the 1730s in Oxford, and they were reading the Bible, and he had an experience where he felt this burning sensation, this powerful sensation that he was sinful, but that he'd been redeemed by God, been saved by God. Uh, and this becomes the origins of the evangelical movement within the Church of England. In fact, within the modern origins of the evangelical movement in Christianity, more generally speaking, um, because he begins to sort of, he gets the idea that everyone who doesn't have this experience is, is damned, everybody has it saved. And he goes around, begin preaching this message, um, much to the chagrin of authorities in 18th century England who didn't care much for this, Partly, by the way, because he did, uh, Wesley went to impoverished rural areas, he, he appealed to the poor, partly because it was kind of embarrassing, some of the things they did in these, these revivalist type meetings, but well, initiated was effectively a religious revolution because this will spread, uh, again, he's really, for the first several decades of his life, he's really hated by the, again, the English upper classes, again, this looks like, you know, uh, lower class, you know, vulgar. Uh, by the end of the century, by the time he dies in 1791, the Methodists will have reshaped the Church of England. So it definitely has a, a, an effect there. Of course, it spreads to British America. One of Wesley's compatriots is a man named George Whitfield. He will go to the colonies in the 1730s and 40s and, and conduct a series of these revivals. And this is the origin of the so-called Great Awakening in British America, which starts in the 1730s, only gets subsumed by the, the conflict that occurs in the American Revolution. We'll restart again, not the same thing, but more or less the same thing in the early 1800s. And so uh, it's the beginnings of modern, again, it's supposed to be the age of, of reason, rationality, but you have this burgeoning with essentially emotional form of piety and expression becoming more widespread. Abolitionism. Um, this begins among the Quakers in England in the 18th century. In 1787, there was a society for the abolition of the slave trade uh, created in Britain. Uh, one of its founders, it, they have Quakers who found it, but they want to get some Anglicans on board because they're more influential. They have more, um, they'd be more influential in political terms. And the man who becomes most associated with this movement is William Wilberforce, who's a pious Anglican evangelical. I actually made a movie about this a few years ago, 10 years ago. It's called Amazing Grace. Not a very, you know, imaginative title, but it was a good film. Point is, um, uh, it, it will succeed in 20 years' time. They'll eventually get the slave trade abolished in the, in the uh, British Empire. Again, that has definite religious roots. And then finally, just one thing to, to, to mention about all this is that you do have, I put it in question marks, there shouldn't be a question mark. Historians are a lot more sensitive to the fact that most people who are would consider themselves religious or devout in the 18th century would not have much to do with the encyclopedia, but nevertheless, they did actually have openness to certain ideas, you know, in terms of sciences and stuff like this. Uh, I talked about this a little bit before, but there is actually a movement to within the Catholic Church, among even among some clergy, to again take a more um, critical look 
uh, at things like biblical scholarship uh, without necessarily by, uh, necessarily, by the way, abandoning, you know, things like supernatural and stuff like this within the Catholic Church. There are reformers uh, among the clergy. There are, you know, scientists who are maintain their religious uh, faith. Uh, one big example, best example, actually, is a, a man who was a, a scholar before he became, well, he became Pope, uh, but in the 14th, in the middle of the 17, uh, uh, middle of the 18th century, a guy named Prosper Lambertini was well regarded uh, as a scholar before he became Pope. Uh, actually uh, applauded Voltaire when his play uh, called Muhammad, it was critical of Islam, so I did it, but still, you had, you did have thinkers who were uh, not opposed to changes in, uh, uh, um, you know, the church in terms of its its privileges or uh, about certain doctrines being modified or something like this. Um, the thing to mention here is there's a broad, probably a broad, I think, consensus among educated people, even if they, know, even if they still adhere to Catholic orthodoxy, um, probably, I don't know as much about the Protestant side, but probably there as well, that are open to reform. But the thing, here's the key, and this is probably what gives, you know, impetus to, in some ways, the more radical enlightenment, because there's this more general, I, general desire for reform, uh, I can think maybe some of the more radical reformers piggyback on that impetus uh, later on, perhaps. And then finally, in evaluating the enlightenment as a cause, this is getting to be a long one here in this lecture, but uh, big ideas, big things we're talking about here. If you're talking about it as a cause, one thing you have to mention is that, uh, and what's the cause of it becoming uh, influential is that, first of all, it's a diverse, very diverse, movement. As I mentioned, I pointed out to you some of the tensions. They are much more, the thinkers I've mentioned, they're much more unified by what they're against than what they're for, which is fairly standard, but they have a lot of different ideas. They're really not one enlightenment when it comes down to it. Really, there are several different forms of it, versions of it. Uh, and so it, you keep that in mind. when You talk about, okay, is it, is it a cause and is there an it in singular term? And secondly, this can't be stressed enough. Most historians understand it's confined to a very, very small, tiny elite. Uh, there's probably no more than a, a few hundred people, really. Uh, maybe, maybe more than that, but a few thousand at best. In fact, I showed you that list of works there that, was, that I mentioned, um, giving the idea of how, how small this world actually is of the philosophes the salon I, I mentioned salon that's the big thing in every textbook right uh that's a salon almost every person i went on that list uh visited uh the same salons like uh i, I hadn't mentioned uh, there aren't many open atheists in the 18th century one of them is the baron dolbach dolbach was a philosopher published a work in the 1770s um it's called the system of nature, 1770, which was openly materialistic, openly rejected the idea of God. Um, almost everyone on that list went to his salon at some point, Acadia, Gibbon, all these people from across Europe. It's very international, but it's very tiny, uh, very cosmopolitan, but very a very small group of people, it's like the Davos of the, of the 18th century. You know what that is. Um, thirdly, Okay, why is it, why are these ideas finally becoming a little bit more acceptable to people? I think you have to point to French military failures. Now that may sound kind of again, but how, what does that have to do with ideas? Well, again, one of the reasons why you know uh, France was seen as a, a, a beacon of civilization. Well, you know, they were successful, and the most basic feature of any government is it's successful militarily. And what it seemed like, again, you know, take, I guess when I go back to Britain, there's this, it's not necessarily logical, but you associate greater openness with, uh, in political terms, with greater openness of ideas. And so when the French monarchy no longer seemed like it could provide the glory that it had in the past, I think this led some people to sort of rethink, because it was associated, right, there wrongly, as we've seen, with tradition and custom in all their areas of you know, intellectual life. And then finally, I'll mention this last thing because I've been beating on this uh, for a while. When it comes to eventually the people who will eventually make the French Revolution happen, the people who will meet, we'll get to this in a moment, and the, uh, who create the first national assembly, most of them are fairly young. Most of them are lawyers in their 40s. And that means they, you know, 1789, they were born in the 1740s. 
So they've only ever known, first of all, on the one hand, the stability of the French monarchy, but they've also seen very clearly its, its, its flaws. And so that's, again, it's different if you lived through the late 17th century and then into the reign of Louis XV, you, you would appreciate the stability that you know, Louis XIV brought to France. But if you're born after that, you don't see it. All you see is its failures, perhaps. So it's probably a generational shift that might, that might explain why the Enlightenment becomes more effective after 1750. And so finally, we're getting to the brass tax here, or move from the European down to the French, well, it's still European, but uh, to uh, the failure of reform in the French monarchy in the 1760s. Because if you kind of haven't gotten it so far, what I've said, I may make this clear, <laughs> the source of most reforms in the 17th, 18th century, political and social and otherwise, are absolute monarchies. They have the responsibility for it. They have the only, only, only institution with the power to do it or the desire. And in fact, this is gonna be one of the things that actually topples the monarchy is the failure to promote certain reforms in state, in society in the 18th century. Now, a couple of things, and I haven't talked about this in a while, but I have talked about before, what French social structure is like. If you recall, going back to the, um, Middle Ages, the ideal was, and this is how laws are actually passed. Uh, French society is conceived as, as a society of orders. There's three orders, so-called. There's the clergy, the nobility, everybody else. <laughs> We're called the third estate, the three estates. And all the laws are structured that way, even in the 18th century. And I say they're structured that way because there's not necessarily, there are some laws, but most laws are not, like we, we think of a law today, right? Pass a law, Congress passes a law, it applies to everybody, every citizen equally, as individuals, everywhere. It doesn't work that way in French society. Why? Because you have these orders with privileges and rights that other orders don't have. The clergy and the nobility are exempt from most forms of taxation in the 18th century. All the burden of the of taxation, for example, most of it falls on the third estate. But you also have other different types of uh, privileges. Different provinces in France might have different customs. Uh, I mentioned the parlementaire in the lecture on Jansenism. The parlement of these regional bodies, 13 regional bodies, or administrative and legal, legal uh, bodies carry out those sorts of tasks um, for the crown. Um, those parlements are, are run by people who are hereditary, who have hereditary title to be in those parliaments, and they have rights and privileges. They all fight for this stuff like cats and dogs. And what this means is um, if the monarchy wants to do something, they have to contend with this um, because the, for as absolute as it makes claims to be, the French monarchy has to respect these traditions and customs. For all of its claims to absolute authority, it depends on that. <laughs> Can't do away with it. Um, and it has a problem because it, you know, taxation prior to the 18th century produced plenty of wealth because they have a big population, they have you know, good land. But one of the things that happens is that um, as time goes on, need to have more money. Basically, you they're forced into expedience to get around all these exceptions. And so what they'll do is they'll hire out tax farmers to go collect taxes. Again, there's not a, an actual system, you know, a centralized system of taxation necessarily, who have an in incentive um, to squeeze as much as they can from the third estate, and not from the nobility or the, uh, the clergy, and very little incentive to send uh, inc an incentive to send as little as they can back to the regime. So over time, you're having more and more of a squeezing effect on the third estate, which, and this is the, the key term here, the third estate's not a bunch of impoverished peasants. They're not. That ideal no longer matches the reality by the 18th century. It's basically long since to match it because the third estate is made up of wealthy merchants and bankers. Uh, and in fact, you're also gonna have people who, of course, we talked about this before, buy their way or marry their way into the nobility. They can purchase noble titles. So this French social structure in the 18th century does not back up, match up with their tax, tax system at all. And this, of course, becomes a huge problem. <clears throat> 
And from the 1760s, or actually earlier than that, from the 1750s, you begin to have, 1740s, I should say, um, you're going to have attempts to make the system work. 1749, uh, a finance minister tries to impose a uniform tax on all landed property, was defeated. In the 1760s, the government's going to start to adopt uh, taxation. They're going to try, for example, as I mentioned before, to uh, remove some of the uh, clergy's tax exemptions. There's a big pushback on this. But more to the point, a group of reformers called the physiocrats, and they're important because they're called the physiocrats. They um, they uh, they try to abolish traditional restrictions on the grain trade. The idea is to reduce it. Uh, reduce restrictions, encourage production, expand the tax base. Um, but there's a series of bad harvests in the 1760s, which produced a shortage, made the export of the grain from the kingdom seem politically like you didn't know to do that. It'd be a very terrible thing to do. Uh, and the physiocrats, by the way, tried a whole host of things. Um, again, when, that, that term physiocrat, they're trying to employ, to employ what they thought of as scientific methods to finance, to the economy. And that will be the inspiration, the critical inspiration, the critical of them, uh, for Adam Smith and his ideas, because they're going to talk about abolishing some restraints on trade. So they're trying different things, but they're getting pushed back from these more traditional bodies in the state. In 1770, a minister named Mopu tries to write off the royal debt. And then in the next couple of years, um, um, to remove obstructionist judges in the parliaments, and then um, basically dissolve them all together in 1774. Because again, remember the Parliament were these bodies that could that it had been so opposed to any sort of you know reduction of their traditional privileges of people like nobility. So they just try to get rid of them. Unfortunately, that same year, uh, Louis the 15th dies. And in um, in uh, this frustrates these reform plans, but especially 1776, Louis the Sixteenth, who's new to the throne, is not a bad guy or that incompetent, but he feels unsure of himself. In order to placate uh, opposition, he restores the Bonhomme in 1776. Meanwhile, uh, I mentioned um, uh, Henri uh, Robert Turgot, 1776. He's a minister uh, at this point. He tries to revamp France's economy along free market lines. Uh, he tries to lift restrictions on the grain trade, but also abolish guilds, urban guilds, which govern, you know, production, art, 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 uh, all sorts of production. Some of them have what amount to monopolies, of course, uh, in this system. You know, uh, they restrict competition, they govern the production of many manufactured goods. There's popular protests and opposition from the parliaments, and they stop him. However, his successor uh, later on in the 1770s, a man named Jacques Necker, uh, retreats from these reforms, but tries to save money by limiting the offices and collecting taxes more efficiently. So you have all of these things coming together in the 1770s uh, to you know, suppress all these attempts by these reforming ministers. <laughs> and it goes back to the social structure and all the privileges these people have, these bodies have, or I forgot to mention. Necker does something uh, radical in 1781. By this time, he's uh, so desperate to try to overcome all these issues. He does something that nobody's ever done before. Um, he actually will, um, he will actually publish uh, the royal budget in 1781. Why is this significant? Well, he's trying to appeal to public opinion over the heads of the parlementaires and nobility. And um, the, the royal budget had never been made public, ever. Again, that's a prerogative of, of, of an absolute monarch, right? You don't tell people because you, you're the sovereign. You don't have to justify yourself to anybody else. Uh, and this, this gambit did not work, by the way. Uh, eventually, he had to resign because of it. So they're trying all sorts of things. And this is becoming more and more desperate because by 1786, the monarchy is at this point almost completely bankrupt. Um, a series of bad harvests, a series of other things will um, weaken its uh, uh, weaken uh, its attempts um, uh, weaken its attempts to do these sorts of things. Um, uh, it's nearly insolvent by 1876, as I mentioned before. This financial crisis, and the uh, minister at the time, 
uh, well, one other thing I should mention about this is that one of the things that made them insolvent is they spent so much money aiding the uh, the American uh, rebels in the seventeen uh, the American War Revolution. Uh, they were supposed to be paid back those loans they gave them. The United States government defaulted on those loans in 1787, so um, didn't get any help uh, from their fellow 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 lovers of liberty. In other words, uh, in 1787. And so, in desperation, the minister Cologne, now the main minister in 1787, decides to call for an assembly of notables in 1787 to discuss fundamental changes. And uh, one of the things that's going to happen in this is you're going to have um, you're going to have um, uh, him trying to basically get uh, public opinion behind reform proposals, get uh, uh, support for a land tax be level on everybody and breaking. And again, this threatens the breaking down of all these social distinctions. But the notables were and the notables, by the way, are, are nobility, wealthy people, clergy, stuff like this. Um, one of the things that had happened is that these notables remembered what Necker had done in 1781. Um, his account, which showed the royal budget, was supposed to show that existing taxes were more than sufficient to cover all our expenditures. Um, this made the notable sound suspicious because, hey, five years ago you were talking about six years, you were talking about, well, you had all the money you needed, now you're bankrupt. Uh, and so they were very, 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 very suspicious of these claims. They were, uh, they, uh, things were on the brink here. And instead they demanded, uh, you know, precise accounting procedures and stuff like this instead of ending um, their privileges. And again, Cologne, again, once again, went to the public, printed his proposals, went over the head of the public. Um, but nobody trusted the ministers at this point. And public opinion sort of um, went toward the notables. And so by 1787, it seems like all this failed. He is replaced by a man named Vin. And um, so things are getting you know, desperate at this point. Um, in April of 1787, there are attempts uh, by Brienne and his supporters to try to get parliaments to pass, the Parliament of Paris is the most important one, to pass certain versions of reforms, mixtures of concession, pressures. Um, and so you have uh, a, uh, a promise to, uh, to do these sorts of things. When the parliament met, it was about to discuss this stuff. But Louis XVI kind of ruined all this by basically saying, no, you can't debate this, just pass it, yes or no. That immediately led, led to uh, um, outrage amongst the judges in the parliament and the public. And by this time, they uh, were desperate again. They decided, OK, we'll try to abolish the parliament. Uh, and so an edict is issued in May 1788. This leads to, again, more outrage, trying to get rid of these things. And in 1788, in the, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, there are riots against royal troops in various cities like Grenoble in June. Should mention, by the way, that summer you also have a hailstorm which damaged crops in much of northern France, which, provoked a, which led to a steep rise in bread prices that continued to the next year. This led to agitation. There's a lot of things going on at this point. And so finally, something that had been discussed by parliamentarians for a little while, but resisted comes to the fore. Because at this point, the monarchy is really in trouble and the ministers know it. And so this is what's going to lead to the revolution. Because uh, at this point, they really only have one recourse. I mentioned, by the way, that in terms of taxation, the monarchy could only, uh, only had to respect all these privileges. And so they could only collect taxes that had been passed, that were you know traditional things. They couldn't pass new ones. It was very hard. The only way you could have done that um, to get new taxes was to have called for the Estates General. If you remember, the Estates General was the actual medieval Parliament of uh, of France, right? Remember, the absolute monarchy basically stopped calling it in 1614. Got rid of it. Why? Because now it's ruling by itself. At this point, they're so desperate, they actually have been called for this. They finally do it. In uh, July of 1788, uh, they call for a meeting of the Estates General. 
And again, this is a radical proposal. It's not been called for 175 years, practically. And there are a series of debates, public debates in the fall of 1788 over how the election should be conducted. Um, there's a famous pamphlet published by a, a priest named the Abbe Cies called What is the Third Estate? And the arguments have to do with how, you know, how, how the different estates are going to be represented. The idea basically is that the third estate is a lot bigger and it should have more representation. You do have efforts by some of the French ministers to, um, to make for, uh, to make for uh, the, uh, the estates general a little more representative at the same time. And, um, uh, and you'll have Jacques Necker come back in, coming back into uh, 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 the ministry at this point. And um, yeah, and so you're going to have various ideas. and You're going to have it proceed. Um, um, uh, you know, there's going to be a doubling of the third estate, basically, in terms of the numbers of deputies. Um, and um, so you do have a, a, a bigger number. You have a bigger number of the third estate when you meet. Uh, and so there are elections held in, uh, between January and April of 1789. At the same time, the government does something, again, fairly novel and radical. They print up these little sheets that are called Cahiers de Doléance, little pre-printed. Um, it's a survey, basically. Um, Cahiers de Doléance means records of grievances and allows people, electors in all these different places to list what their biggest grievances are. And let me tell you, some of these, some of these things are fascinating. I've not looked at a lot of them myself. They actually had, if you go to the, um, the research library at the University of Kansas, the Spencer Research Library, they have a collection of these in there. And uh, one of my colleagues, one of my teachers at KU years ago told me he went in there and looked at them and they're very fascinating. They're definitely calls for reform. They're not necessarily the stuff that's gonna happen after 1789. <laughs> uh, I'll give you the best example is that the church. There are lots of complaints about the church. What happens after 1789 is, is, is well, I'm not going to spoil it for you. It's the destruction of the church in France, basically, by a revolutionary government. They weren't calling for that at all in these Cahiers. They were calling, what they were calling for was reform in terms of the church in France was very top heavy in terms of like you had very insanely wealthy bishops and then parish priests who were like half starved and uneducated. What they were calling for was their priests to be better paid, better educated. Um, there's no talk of like getting rid of, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty interesting, in other words. In other words, widespread call for reform, not everybody had the same ideas in 1789. But then it finally meets on May 3rd, 1789. And one of the big problems they have is, again, you have several hundred members of the Third Estate meeting. They're not sure how they're supposed to meet. Are they going to meet as a body? Are they going to meet separately? Again, the, traditionally, they were supposed to meet separately because, again, they're different estates. Um, and in fact, as they, they begin to meet, they don't really have a lot of support um, from the monarchy. Louis the Louis the Sixteenth gets a bad rap. He's a fairly decent guy, well intentioned, but he didn't have a real. He wasn't really a great political leader. Uh, and Jacques Necker was a bureaucrat. He didn't have any notion of how to handle the crisis. And um, and so at this point, you're left, uh, you leave the state's general on its own to decide this thing. And one of the things that was happening is the third estate, members of the third estate, thought they were going to be basically dominated by the other two orders. And so they decided to uh, basically paralyze the whole assembly that <clears throat> after it met by refusing to organize itself and begin work unless the other two groups met with them in, uh, as a body in common. And this, of course, forces a crisis because they're basically saying is we have to meet as one body, not as three estates, but as one body and one, one entity. After weeks of uh, fruitless negotiations, um, the third estate on June 10th decides to send an, a, a, an invitation to the nobility and clergy to meet and form a single assembly and then proceed without them if they decline. They are joined by a handful of clergy and then on June 17th, 1789, they basically vote to assume the name of a national assembly and proclaim that they were speaking for the entire country as a whole. And this spread like wildfire uh, via newspapers, uh, you know, 
uh, manuscript newsletters all over the place. Uh, and this is, of course, this is this, by the way, this in some ways is the beginning of the revolution. Because what they're saying basically is, again, think back to my earlier lectures, if you can bother to do that. Um, remember what government, remember what sovereignty is, right? There's one sovereign, they alone have the right to make laws to govern the country. By declaring themselves a single assembly and represent the whole country, this is basically a declaration that the nation is sovereign. And so a few days later, um, the king responds. He tries to uh, get a special session of all three orders together. In the meantime, royal officials lock the deputies of the National Assembly out of the Arabian meeting hall. Fearing the king would try to reject their decisions, the member of, of the National Assembly held an emergency session in the only place they could find big enough to hold them, which is the, ten the king's tennis court, his indoor tennis court. And that, by the way, is the picture which forms the background for my <laughs> for my my lecture here. This is the called the oath of the tennis court, where they pledged themselves not to go home until they had given France a constitution. The king eventually, after a few days, backed down. Uh, faced with the intransigence of, uh, of the third estates, he ordered himself the, the, the deputies of the clergy and the nobility to join the national assembly. Um, However, um, there were, uh, they were at the same time, uh, they made this concession. Um, and they, by the way, he also ordered them to start drafting a constitution. But um, they were not out of the, things were not uh, out of the woods yet. Ministers had begun to assemble troops in the capital. And so there was already a sense we're gonna need to put this down by force. And this is a fact what leads to probably the event you're most familiar with, you know anything about the revolution is that you have the, um, you will have violence already breaking out in several parts of the country, uh, unrest because of bad you know, economic conditions. In April of that year, artisans and workers in, uh, in uh, uh, Paris's uh, Faubourg Saint Antoine district had sacked the mansion of a, 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 a manufacturer who was wealthy, uh, who'd been accused of trying to lower wages. And so you're gonna have more and more excitement uh, coming up from across the, um, uh, across the political uh, 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 spectrum. And uh, popular sympathy in Paris is overwhelmingly with the uh, Third Estate. Now, what happens is you're going to have greater and greater fear um, that troops uh, or, who are now aligning in the capital are going to use put down this movement. Um, and in fact, the crowds in the uh, the city began besieging several royal or, or, royal arsenals and demanding uh, weapons from them. Um, and in fact, uh, army commanders warned uh, the crowd that they could not count on their men to fight against the Parisians. And so, in fact, in, what happens on July fourth is that a large crowd of uh, mostly artisans and shopkeepers, aided by some of the uh, regiments who were actually stationed in the city, stormed the Bastille. <clears throat> And again, the Bastille, by the way, if you don't know, had been a symbol of, of the monarchy's authority. Uh, again, this is where you had political prisoners, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, held before, you know, uh, in the 18th century. But by this time, there were only a handful of people in it, and it was only defended by a few people. The real significance, the real reason why they stormed it was because it, uh, the, um, um, they, stormed it, uh, they stormed it because it had weapons in there. Uh, weapons in it and um, and ammunition, and so you have this uh, you have this assault on the Bastille when they storm in. They basically went up killing the the, the governor of the Bastille. Yes. Uh, uh, stop uh, storming the Bastille, uh, cutting their heads off and putting them on pikes and marching them around around the uh, around the city. And so uh, things are getting sort of nasty. You also begin to have um, the so-called great fear breaking out uh, in the countryside where you're gonna have brigands, um, excuse me, you're gonna have rumors about um, aristocrats uh, becoming opponents of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the revolution that was about to start devastating their crops. And you're gonna have um, rumors about people being, you know, aristocrats being killed and stuff like this. Um, but you're going to have riots among peasants. Um, 
um, forcing local, you know, the ability to determine their charters and deans that had, you know, consecrated their their um, their um, their their privileges. And so basically, you have a, a move in the countryside to to put down all these feudal privileges. And so what happens is going forward, I'm going to bring this to an end here. The National Assembly tries to head all this off. And in fact, they're inspired by a lot of Enlightenment ideas. August 4th, National Assembly abolishes all feudal privileges. They basically get rid of every last single vestige of legal privilege from the old order at a stroke. The Lord, and three weeks later, uh, on August 26th, they publish uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizen, which is a declaration of the basic fundamental universal rights that every citizen has. I will go through all this stuff. Needless to say, the revolution's on <laughs> by, by the end of August of 1789. You have a clear indication that um, they are going to do away with that Austrian regime and establish something. They don't know what yet. Declaration of Rights of Men and Citizen is not a constitution. It's a declaration of the uh, uh, allegedly inviolable rights that um, that uh, human beings have, which if you don't, why this is a, and nobody saw this initially, by the way, there, there was euphoria when this happened. Everyone was basically, at least publicly on board with this as of August 26, 1789. I, I think there was a Te Deum song, if I'm not mistaken, Te Deum is a, a traditional Catholic religious um, hymn that was sung, I believe, in August 26, 1989. By this point, you have serious conflicts because what you're saying is you have these inviolable rights of mankind and citizen that are universal, that have always existed. Well, if that's the case, then you've had a government that's been violating them from time out of mind. <laughs> in fact, its very existence is opposed to it. And of course, you're going along with the creation of the National Assembly, you have all the makings of a modern government already, which is why we're going to end um, this uh, lecture here. You have the ensuing, you'll get some of the ensuing events in the textbook if you read through it. But for all intents and purposes, you are on the cusp of an entirely new world. Not entirely, but a very new world in 1789. So that's why I'm going to stop here. The world we have talked about throughout this course, or I have talked about, uh, the early modern world is coming to an end. And so we'll stop there. And I will have one more uh, lecture for you next time to wrap all this up. I'll talk a little bit about the aftermath after 1789. Uh, of course, it will lead to a violent revolution. It will lead to 25 years, a quarter century of warfare in Europe. That's all. If I ever teach the modern version the, from 1789 onward of this course, I'll talk about that in detail. But at this point, you are entering into, you are leaving the uh, early modern world, at least in France. Again, history doesn't work like that. I when I say that the, the third estate declaring itself to be the National Assembly is the revolution in some sense, it's not like people, it, it didn't in of itself accomplish anything. But in retrospect, you can see that's the moment. And it's very rare in history for that to be, to, to be the case where you can identify it that easily. Very hard, actually. Uh, and sometimes you can get this very, you know, silly textbook view of history where history is a bunch of august looking men going into meetings and issuing documents and making speeches and that's history. And it took it took it took massive amounts of bloodshed to make good those nice phrases that were put into the to the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. Horrific amounts of bloodshed, I might add. Just to give you one example. Lovely statement, right? Declaration of Rights of Men and Citizens, freedom, raw. The government's still totally bankrupt in September of 1789. And, and, and of course, you know how they get around it, right? Um, they, uh, they nationalize, nationalize church lands. That is, they, they steal them <laughs> in the name of the nation. And that, that will be the, that would be the beginning of a lot of, I won't go into it, but the point is, it leads to extremities that nobody could have foreseen when those estates generals met, uh, members of the states general met in 1789. And so that is the end of our lecture. Hopefully that helps you. I know that's long-winded, but give you some idea. And that big panoply of things for your essay, what role is the American Revolution play? I didn't even mention, of course, that um, 
the American delegation to Paris, Adams, Jefferson, Franklin, all Enlightenment figures. And of course, they were feted. Well, they, were, they loved Franklin in London, actually in Paris. And you know, you also have that virus of revolutionary ideas makes it popular, but um, keep all those things in mind. And uh, one last lecture to wrap all things up next time. And uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully this hopefully been a worthwhile experience anyway uh, to read, uh, listen to all this stuff for you. So uh, we'll talk to you guys one last time. See you then. <laughs>